Bill Browder is the founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital and author of the book Red Notice. He is, of course, an expert on Russia and uh, the man behind the Magnitsky Act. Bill, thank you for being with us. And I, I guess I'd like to start right there, which is, uh, you know, the, the concern that Russia will uh, be tampering in some way. I think we make the assumption that it's sort of whack-a-mole, that they will, they will be making efforts. Um, how worried would you be about this coming election in November in the U.S.? Uh, I'd be very worried. Uh, Russia, <clears throat> it's been uh, proven that they, they were actively involved in, in the 2016 U.S. election. They were very keen on Donald Trump being elected. Uh, they've been very active in just about every election where they have an opportunity. They were involved in the Brexit uh, referendum in the UK. They were involved in hacking Emmanuel Macron, the French president's emails before the French presidential election. And as far as the US is concerned, nothing has been done to shore up the system, to put up defenses. Uh, and as a result, Putin understands that when there's no barriers, He's just going to go at it again, and surely he's going at it again. There's certainly reports that he is, and and uh, the only question is whether he, on the margin, he can tip the scales in any way because of um, it, because if he can, he will. What is in it for Putin to have Donald Trump uh, win a second term? Well, Putin um, loves Trump because Trump loves Putin. Uh, Trump has said. Uh, he um, he admires Putin. He he uh, he says he doesn't think that Putin has committed <clears throat> all the criminal acts that we know he's committed. And Trump has done a lot of things which Putin likes, like questioning NATO, like pulling troops out of Syria. Um, uh, tr Trump has 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 run a U.S. foreign policy which is as close. Uh, to Putin's as, as he can get. And, and that's something which um, Putin likes. And Putin doesn't want an establishment person in the job, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, anybody from, from the establishment uh, who understands what Putin is up to and would not allow him to get away with the things he gets away with. Uh, but Trump, for, for, for whatever reason, has decided that he likes Putin. It, one thing that strikes me as a bit interesting, Bill, is uh, many citizens in Western countries are aware of uh, you know, the, the perceived threat from China as a state actor that could uh, you know, spy and uh, you know, infringe on copyright and technology. Uh, I think many fewer people lie awake at night worrying about Russia. And yet when I've talked to senior security officials in the UK and the US, they would say they're actually more worried about Russia. What are we missing? And I say we kind of the broad perception out there uh, that, that Russia is up to that's damaging that we should maybe be paying more attention to. Well, I, I, I think they're, they're both really um, dangerous threats to Western democracy and civilization and free speech and freedom generally. Uh, but they have different approaches. <clears throat> Russia has what I call the um, really blatant short-term criminal approach. You know, they're, they're assassinating people in the streets. They're poisoning people. They're shooting down passenger planes. They're openly cheating in international sports events. Um, they're <clears throat> invading foreign countries. Ch China is is got a uh, probably is probably more dangerous in the long term, but they're more subtle in the short term. And so China does has lots of very dangerous ambitions, but they're not so dangerously short term in their approach. Um, and so it makes it a little bit, um, uh, I mean, it, it's it, I mean, it's six of one half dozen of the other. I mean, China needs to be uh, dealt with when it comes to Hong Kong. China needs to be dealt with when it comes to the Uyghurs. China needs to be dealt with on a lot of different uh, uh, areas. But I mean, Russia is the one that that's um, shooting people down in, in the middle of Western European capitals and po using chemical weapons to poison their Putin's political opponents and so on. And so, um, you know, they're they're both they're, bo they're both very uh, troublesome as far as any um, national security pe person uh, would assess. 
we definitely, I mean, we've had evidence, obviously, in recent years of, of Russia's willingness to uh, to tread on other nations' rights, um, Ukraine being the most obvious example. Uh, Crimea remains a, an outstanding example. Belarus is an interesting one um, that, you know, I don't know whether you think it should be getting more global attention, uh, but it, it's certainly not getting the kind of global attention that it, you, it might get if another country were in play in this way. Uh, what is in it for Russia to, def, to destabilize a place like Belarus? Well, so, it, I mean, Putin has got a real dilemma. Uh, right next door to him, there is a dictator who's been around longer than he has. So Lukashenko, the dictator of Belarus, has been there for 26 years. Putin has been dictator in Russia for 20 years. And so what Putin is seeing right now is that the people of Belarus have had enough. They're, they're sick and tired of the fraudulent elections, of the corruption, <clears throat> and all the other things that go along with the Lukashenko dictatorship. And they're rising up in the hundreds of thousands and marching through the streets of Minsk and other, and other places in Belarus. And Putin is watching this with absolute panic, because if the Belarusian people kick out Lukashenko, it sends an extremely strong message to the Russian people that these dictators can be kicked out. And what Putin is most worried about is the same thing happening in Russia, where the people of Russia rise up. And they will be inspired by the people of Belarus. And so the, the issue for Putin right now is how does he prevent the dictatorship from falling uh, in Belarus? What can he do? And what he doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to go in and, and place all of his bets on Lukashenko and then lose because that's another major loss of face. And so he's in a very difficult position because all he can do is sort of push around the edges. So he can send in um, secret policemen. He can give Lukashenko a bit of money, but he can't actually go in and invade mm -hmm. Belarus to support the dictatorship. You know, I, want, I do want to ask you about um, Canada and its use or, or lack thereof of the, of, of the Magnitsky Act. Um, one of your enduring legacies, right, this act named for your friend and lawyer um, killed in Russia, that does allow uh, states, governments, to impose very direct and targeted kind of sanctions um, that should really bring uh, more, more pressure on other governments. Could Canada be doing more uh, with, and the, the example being used is China, when it comes to human rights, uh, to bring pressure on that government? Well, so the Magnitsky Act was passed in Canada in October of 2017. And very shortly after the, the, the Magnitsky Act was passed, about 70 individuals from Russia, from, from uh, Saudi Arabia and various other places were sanctioned. And then that was the last time that, that Canada ever used its Magnitsky Act. We're living in a world now which, which I would describe as on fire. It's burning right now. There's troubles everywhere. There's troubles in China. There's troubles in Belarus. There, <clears throat> there's troubles all over the world. And Canada has not used the Magnitsky Act. And uh, I was watching, there was a speech, Trudeau gave a speech at the United Nations calling on all nations to stand up to this evil. And, and, it, and it bothered me that he was saying that. Well, at the same time as he was saying this, he had an opportunity, he continues to have an opportunity to use the Magnitsky Act, which, which he and his government passed um, to apply targeted sanctions to people doing terrible things, like the Chinese officials setting up concentration camps for millions of Uyghurs, um, like the Lukashenko regime, who are involved in, in torturing and, and beating peaceful protesters. And he's so far do not done it. And, and I'm, you know, Canada's got a reputation of being a, a you know, wholesome um, sanctuary country, um, doing good things, caring about human rights, but it's not the, the, the reputation is, is not being mirrored by the actions at the moment. What, and just more specifically on that, what kind, where would you start with that? When you say mirrored by the actions, what would be the single biggest step you want to see us take? Well, I, I think that, that the United States has sanctioned a number of officials involved in the um, concentration camps and genocide of the Uyghur people I don't know how China, I don't know how Canada can stand by and do nothing. Uh, the United States has sanctioned mm -hmm. people involved in the uh, um, suppression of, of peaceful demonstrators in Hong Kong. I don't know how Canada can do nothing. Um, and and then you have a number of other countries. Uh, uh, Estonia has sanctioned using the Magnitsky Act 120 Belarus officials. I mean, 
you know, whatever excuses Canada makes or Trudeau makes for not sanctioning China, well, there is no excuse for not sanctioning uh, the people in Bel the officials in Belarus who are who are doing all this terrible stuff. It's great to have your voice on this, Bill. Appreciate it. Bill Browder is the founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital and author, of course, of the book Red Note.